Welcome to The Culture Bar, a panel discussion podcast exploring, dissecting and shedding light on important topics in the arts and music world which matter to you. Hello, I'm Fiona Livingston and in this After Hours podcast I will be talking to Finn Kennedy about bringing diverse voices to theatre and audio drama. Finn is an award-winning playwright and director of Tamasha Theatre Company, a company that nurtures talent and emerging writers and artists from diverse backgrounds. He has written for Soho Theatre, Southwark Playhouse, Bristol Old Vic, and has had eight afternoon plays broadcast on BBC Radio 4, including On Kosovo Field, which was inspired by unreleased songs by musician PJ Harvey. Finn's newest project, Out of the Woods, directly inspired by On Kosovo Field, is supporting and producing a series of contemporary audio dramas written by emerging Balkan writers eager to tell the stories from a region, carving out its identity and eager to regain agency. Alongside writing, Finn also teaches, blogs, campaigns, fundraises and mentors other writers. As artistic director at Tamasha, he founded Tamasha Playwrights, a writer-led collective with numerous successful alumni. Finn is also an activist within the arts. His In Battalion report of 2013 presented evidence of the damage being done to new plays and playwrights by the UK government cuts to the Arts Council. The report received widespread media coverage and had questions tabled in Parliament. Welcome to you, Finn, and thank you for being here with us today. Hi, Fiona. Thanks for asking me. It's nice to be here. Thank you. During our chat, we will find out more about how Finn writes for stage and audio, his campaigning against the neglect of arts funding, how we can support and empower marginalised voices in theatre. And we will also find out more about Finn's radio plays on Kosovo Field and Out of the Woods. Before we dive into these exciting topics, it would be great, Finn, if you could tell us a bit more about yourself and perhaps how you started as a playwright. Oh, gosh, wow. Um, <clears throat> how long have you got? <laughs> I, think, I think every writer or every theatre artist or any artist really has a different kind of story about how they got into it. There's no set career paths in these things. Um, I mean, I, I, said I was lucky in that I knew that I wanted to write plays really young. Um, I was in youth theatres throughout school and studied drama at GCSE and A level and then university. Um, and uh, but but it's not like you open the back pages of the newspaper or the job section and see like playwrights wanted ads. So <laughs> I had to kind of work out how you go about it. So I held loads of jobs across the theatre industry and in offices and also on the production side. In um, I was a crew member and and um, technician and stage manager for a while and. Um, uh, would do anything that came up like front of house marketing I sort of got to know a lot of different theatres from the inside out um, whilst trying to work out how uh, to write plays or at least how to get paid to write plays which is a different thing um, my sort of breakthrough was um, I, I got a bursary to, to study a uh, goldsmith's a master's degree in uh, writing for performance um, which was kind of finally a, a sort of full-time dedicated year to to, to learn my craft and the play that I wrote as part of that masters was picked up and produced by Soho Theatre a play called Protection uh, about social workers um, I'm from a uh, family of social workers um, which was produced at Soho Theatre in 2003 where I was also writer in residence and I kind of thought that from then on it would be straightforward um, and it really wasn't <laughs> despite having had a production and a track record and a, and a residency at a, like a leading new writing theatre um, my second play How to Disappear Completely and Never Be Found was um, rejected by every theatre in London oh, wow. um, which uh, when you're like 23 and starting out uh, and not from a, a, you know, a family of, of with independent means. I'm mm. not from a wealthy family. Social workers don't get wealthy. <laughs> yes. um, then uh, that blew a hole in my finances. And so um, I, I had to go off and retrain. And I retrained as a drama teacher, um, at teaching A-level drama. Um, and it was in the middle of, of that uh, PGCE that I got a call from the Arts Council saying that my play How to Disappear Completely and Never Be Found, which the one rejected by everywhere, had won that year's John Whiting Award, which is, wow. was one of two big awards that they used to run um, and came with um, £6,000 prize money, which yeah. was enough for me to give up the, 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 the PGCE and, and go back to writing full time. Um, but then I was in this really strange position of having journalists ringing me up doing like award-winning play slips through the fingers of all our new writing <laughs> houses kind of articles um and uh, and a play that had already been rejected by everywhere and no one was going to sort of turn around and, and put it on and say oh actually it was quite good we were wrong um 
So it ended up at, um, even though it's all set in London and Essex, it ended up at Sheffield Crucible when Sam West was in charge um, and had a brilliant world premiere directed by Ellie Jones and transferred down to Southwark Playhouse. And the, the place turned out to be kind of perenni perennially popular. Um, it's one of the most licensed plays for students and amateurs in the UK. Um, it's on at Edinburgh Fringe most years. It's been produced internationally five times in America, America alone. So I sort of, it ended up being vindicated, but... It did. It was an early and kind of salutary lesson in um, that you, you a that you can't rely on on playwriting commissions alone to make a living as a writer, mm. um, and b that essentially nobody knows anything, as they say <laughs> in Hollywood. Do you know, what, do you know what I mean? Like you know, there's all these the sort of layers in, 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 I mean, all media, and the theatre is no exception, these layers of gatekeepers that you have to kind of get by and get your work past, and they're not always right. Mm. <laughs> Just because your play gets rejected by everywhere doesn't mean it's no good. <laughs> and, and that's something that I, I kind of pass on to writing students of mine. So the, 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 the big side effect of all this was that I essentially had to look outside the theatre industry to get work as a, as a creative writer. And some of my early commissions were via one of the smallest companies in the industry, actually, Half Moon Young People's Theatre, who were still going in East London. Um, they commissioned and developed two of my plays with teenagers, which did national tours um, uh, and kind of really stood by me while all this was going on. Um, and they then, then led on to a connection with various East London schools, um, and one in particular, Mulberry School for Girls um, on Commercial Road in Tower Hamlets. Uh, who I did various freelance projects for, and then they eventually asked me if I wanted to become their writer in residence. And I wasn't quite sure what I was signing up for. I signed up for like a term. It was a kind of a two day a week job um, on, on part time salary, actually, which was quite unusual. Um, and 10 years later, I was still doing work with them. <laughs> I was sort of, te I was doing kind of classroom support for drama and English. Um, in timetabled sessions, but also after school clubs in playwriting, introduction to playwriting for students, but also for staff. But probably the highest profile thing I did with Mulberry was we took um, four plays to the Edinburgh Fringe every year, which I co-created with their students. Now their students, uh, it's, a, it's a girls' school, state school. Um, it's, they're about 96% Bangladeshi Muslim heritage mm -hmm. students. Um, it's not a selective school or a faith school. That's just the catchment area in Tower yeah. Hamlet. And I was going in as this, you know, uh, you know, young white guy um, <laughs> who kind of couldn't be more different to them in, in many ways. But the whole thing was an absolute joy from start to finish. And I, but I had to sort of develop my own, by default, my own sort of cross-cultural practice about how do you leave yourself at the door and put mm. your skills into the service of those young people and sort of channel their voices and co-create work in a way that they embeds their ideas within it but gives mm -hmm. it a polished professional form which they couldn't achieve on their own but which they take complete ownership of once you kind of hand it back to them um and um, i've got two volumes of plays in the shops from that time in my career now um all large cast plays for predominantly female voices and they're again perennially popular with schools and kind of constantly produced and, and studied um and and that's been it's been a real privilege to sort of contribute to the diversifying the canon i suppose of, of mm. public um, work for particularly for that age group because schools really struggle schools are the most diverse institutions in the country um, and they can't always find play, published plays in the kind of existing canon that, mm. that really reflect that um, and Mulberry was enlightened enough to kind of commission some from me wow. um, and so yeah that was a, a sort of a rare and beautiful thing um, and it led to the job that I've got now in that um, in 2010 there was a general election and the coalition government came in and one of the first things they did was cut the specialist schools and academies scheme which was mm. the fund that paid for my salary at Mulberry which was essentially about getting non-education professionals into schools to, to work with kids um, from all different backgrounds um, so Mulberry and I, and I had to get a bit cleverer about how we worked together. And um, at the time, Tamasha, who um, I'd known about for a long time, the company's um, been going 30 years, um, or 25-ish back then, uh, Tamasha were advertising for um, artists in, uh, associate artists. And when I rang them up and said, what do you want these associate artists to do? They said, suggest something, <laughs> um, which was a brilliantly open brief. So I suggested a pilot playwrights in schools training program yeah. uh, bringing some new diverse uh, young writers from Tamasha's uh, developing artist program which is disproportionately large actually for a very small touring theatre company there's a, a, an emerging artist network of over 2,000 um, actors writers directors designers um, and so we brought uh, eight of those writers into Mulberry they trained with me got a bunch of my creative exercises and their own small group of students and they essentially developed a, a short 20 minute piece 
co co collaboratively with those students as a sort of mini version of the Edinburgh Fringe process that I'd gone through so many times with them. And then Tamasha and, and Mulberry presented those as a scratch night at Soho Theatre, and it, it evolved into what was for a while was, was Tamasha's flagship education programme, a scheme called School Rights, mm -hmm. um, which was a sort of annual rolling programme of playwrights in schools training uh, across London schools. Um, and whilst I was in the middle of delivering that, uh, one of the co-artistic directors and co-founders of the company, Christine Landon-Smith, stepped down um, and rang me up and invited me to apply for her job. Oh, wow. Um, which I honestly wouldn't have considered otherwise. I mean, Tamasha <laughs> was originally founded as the kind of South Asian touring theatre company. Um, mm. The two women who founded it are both from South Asian backgrounds and they, the company was behind East is East and, and stage versions of other kinds of oh, hip wow. like that, which have kind of entered the national canon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, but Chris said to me, look, it's not about who you are really. It's about what you bring mm. and the, the, the practice that I'd been developing over the, the, the sort of those 10 years, really at Mulberry. Um, and I, I took, I, so I applied and, and here I am, but I kind of took the job on. I'm actually leaving this year after seven years, but I took oh. the job. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I took the job on, on sort of the understanding that basically I would never write the plays for the company because Tamash is not here to support writers like me. It just didn't seem right. Yeah. Um, and also, I'm not a director, so <laughs> I won't direct them either. I'm a, I'm a, a playwright, dramaturg and producer. Um, I mean, looking back in a way, it was a bit of an uninspiring pitch because it's like, well, what are you going to do then? <laughs> <laughs> but, my, but, my, but what I said, what I said was essentially I'm going to do what I did at Mulberry School, which was like be a collaborator and a producer in the background, raising the money and coming up with the project sort of ideas and structures um, to develop emerging artists and get them the experience they need early in their careers. So that essentially so they don't have to struggle in the way that I did and kind of mm. leave the profession and retrain just because theatre is so damn unreliable. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm pleased to say that, you know, kind of seven years in, um, I'm looking back on, on you know, years of, of, of having put that into practice. And, it, and it's worked really nicely. It's actually made the company more and more outward facing, having a, an artistic director who isn't going to direct and write all the shows. Or, you know, we will always have to be outward facing to find the new talent, writers and directors and everybody else. Um, mm. And Tamasha Playwrights, which you referenced in your intro, which is a yeah. writer -led collective. Uh, and not a writing course, I should add. It's much more like a professional preparation program of like, right. here's what you need to know to survive in this industry. So we offer training in, in producing and fundraising, how to apply to the Arts Council, how to manage project budgets. Uh, I also train them all as tutors in how to teach playwriting in schools and youth theatres so they can support themselves doing that between play commissions. Mm -hmm. So it's really a quite a holistic kind of year long attachment, which tries to sort of pass on some of the lessons that I've learned um, when you're not one of those playwrights mm. who, who, who gets a smash West End hit in your 20s <laughs> and kind of and then it's plain sailing from there on in which <laughs> frankly, most of us you know um, but also that type of work speaks much more to my ambitions for the art form which mm. is that I've, I've never been that interested in your name in lights and, and you know um, you, I mean that's all lovely when it comes along and, and it has a couple of times and you know it's great for your ego apart from anything else but <laughs> The question I always ask is what effects in the world does that have? Like what actually changes? Yeah. And, you know, usually 200 rich people clap and go home. Now, <laughs> yeah, quite. <laughs> I'd rather take 10 Bangladeshi girls who've never left Tower Hamlet to the Edinburgh Fringe and change their lives. Mm. Um, and that's really the sort of social impact, political, I suppose, small p impact that I'm interested in our art form having. And that's what I've embedded as, as the practice at the heart of, of Tamasha. Um, so, yeah, I hope that gives some sense of, of uh, the journey and, and what I'm about. Yeah, it really does. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating to hear as well and to, you know, to um, get a grasp of, you know, I suppose in a way why you do what you do, you mm. know, um, because this could so easily have just been a conversation about, like you said, your, your name in lights above a theatre, um, you know, celebrating those kinds of successes but actually um this is in a way so much more um interesting because you know this is really so much more about um like you said drama and and society and mm. I, I would love to know more actually about um what your motivation is really for why you focus on the sort of <laughs> the, this sort of social aspect of drama you know focusing on you know maybe underrepresented groups or marginalized peoples or cultures and you know how, how does that inspire you to do what you do oh in so many ways i mean i i sometimes like to joke that i am what happens when two social workers have a playwright <laughs> uh, like, 
I'm actually most interested in the the social and personal uh, and kind of communal impact of, of my work. Um, I'm not I'm not so interested in in art for art's sake. Mm. Um, and but but on sort of more on a more of a sort of aesthetic level, I think that actually those underrepresented communities are where the new stories are. Yeah. You know, and they're the ones about people who've really kind of lived at the sharp end of our society quite often. And if you go and, and, and find and make friends with and collaborate and support those people, either to co-create stories or to tell their own stories, which is something else I do a lot of, then mm -hmm. you end, it's actually good for our art form. Yeah. You know, it's important that we, that, you know, especially in, the, in the, the, the sector where the state invests in, you know, through the Arts Council in the theatre sort of ecosystem and infrastructure, that's people's taxes. You know, mm -hmm. and we should all be represented. Um, and I think there's an appetite for audiences as well, not just to sort of have. I mean, I, in the 90s, there was a huge boom in, in new writing, um, which you might be too young to remember. But I, I, I was sort of coming of age and, and very excited about all that. And there were a lot of wonderful plays written during that time. But if you look back on it, it was very white and it was very middle class and it was very 20 something. Um, and uh, as, as wonderful as, as many of those plays are, and they are classics, don't get me wrong, I actually don't think that's entirely sustainable. I think mm. that we need to be braver and bolder about getting out of our comfort zone and actually investigating the world a bit more. So I'm a bit like an investigative journalist. I sometimes <laughs> talk about investigative playwriting. I, I never really, I've never written about myself in my own life. Um, I mean, apart from anything else, my plays wouldn't be very interesting if I did. Um, <laughs> but I've always got more excited and interested in, in people who've had cons lives and experiences completely unlike mine. But and obviously, in order to do that, there's, has to, there's a sort of a, a very important kind of, you know, ethical almost process that you have to go through, which is to fully involve those people and in, in, in every stage of the process um, and in designing the, the kinds of the project formats as well. Mm -hmm. um, and... That's what that's where I consider my creativity has kind of that's where the engine of my creativity has been over these last seven years. While in a way, my own playwriting career has kind of been on hold while I've been running this company um, because I've wanted to put other people centre stage and I've wanted to come up with projects which bring artists and communities together in innovative ways and which produce new work and um, sometimes hopefully you know sort of more permanent platforms like Out of the Woods which we're, we're going to talk about yeah. um, as, as sort of ongoing ways in which we can engage with one another across or everything that divides us in in the modern world, which you know, God knows, we need to to get over those boundaries better than in the past. Yeah. Um, and I think that with with the pandemic having thrown everything up in the air, there's an opportunity there, as traumatic as it's been, to kind of rearrange how we do things a bit better. Um, so I'm I'm very much about um, the social impact of the work um, and the changes that can be brought about. Uh, by using theatre, not just theatre actually, but storytelling. It's really about yeah. stories and storytelling. Um, we, we talk at Tamasha about um, shaping our world through its stories. I yeah. believe that. I believe stories can change the world um, in big ways and in small ways. I mean, yeah. you, if you look at politics and religion, for example, those are the big ways. They're just a bunch of stories mm. um, about who we are, how we got here. You know, um, all that's about identity and how we relate to each other. Um, and then, you know, in the more obviously story based art forms like theatre, actually, that's a way in which we can start to see each other differently and walk a mile in one another's shoes. Um, and I think that there's a lot more that we could do to harness the power of that to, to, to build, build, build a better society and kind of live together a bit better, really. No, absolutely. No, that, that's a fantastic answer and really inspiring, actually, Finn, to hear you talk in that way. Um, about how important it is to bring these diverse voices because like like you said they're telling new and amazing stories through their own experiences which we can't possibly know about because we haven't mm. lived those experiences so no, that, that's and, really, and really they inspiring. reflect back on those stories reflect back on on who we are as a country they reflect back yeah. on the mainstream you know and force yeah. it to sort of look outside itself mm. um so yeah I'm all for a bit of kind of you know provocation and agitation through <laughs> our, you know. That's, no, that's, that's amazing. But um, I'd love to uh, find out more about um, Out of the Woods, which you um, just mentioned. Um, can, can you tell us a bit more about this project and what yeah. inspired it? And, you know, who, who, who are the writers that you are um, supporting in this? Yeah. So as with so many kind of projects, it grew quite organically over several years. And I was sort of following a bit of a hunch for most of it. Um, <laughs> About five years ago, in the funny way that sometimes happens, the universe sent me two links to Kosovo at the same time. Oh, wow. Uh, 
And the first was uh, a link to a Kosovan theatre company, Intent New Theatre, um, who were based between Pristina and London, um, and we've got someone in common, who were doing a kind of cultural exchange. Their artistic director was coming over here and doing rounds of meetings with various British artistic directors. Um, and uh, so I met up with uh, Christian Kalici, who was um, their artistic director, who we got on like a house on fire straight away. Um, and uh, their executive producer, Mary Martin, who's, who's based in London, she worked her, her day job is at the London School of Economics. Um, and so I kind of started advising them a bit about, they wanted to bring a show to Edinburgh, actually, to the Edinburgh Fringe, um, which I quickly put them off. It's a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> Plus loads of money and you know it's hard to get any attention and so but we did sort of develop a much longer term conversation about how can we sort of support cost and albanian voices and, and in particular uh bring them to to british you know english-speaking audiences so there was that and then at the same time completely independently um bbc radio 4 for whom i've written as many if not more plays than, than stage plays um approached me about um coming on board to this really intriguing project involving PJ Harvey, who oh. um, in 2016, she had a new album out called The Hope Six Demolition Project. She's always been an artist who's been interested in the kind of, the, the intersection between music and politics, a bit like me with oh. stories and, and politics. Um, and she traveled to various former conflict, zo conflict zones as part of the kind of creative inspiration and research for that album one of which was Kosovo. And she brought back a bunch of songs which didn't end up on the album. She calls them orphan songs. Um, and because they hadn't been kind of produced, they, they, they were just these beautifully sort of haunting acoustic four track numbers with just her and a guitar. Um, really uh, uh, mournful about the, the terrible tragedy of, of the breakdown of the former Yugoslavia and, and, and the Balkans wars and Kosovo's experience in 1999 in particular. Um, so PJ Harvey has a relationship with Radio 4. She's scored radio dramas in the past. She guest edited the Today programme once. Um, and she approached a producer I'd worked with before there, Nadia Molinari, about whether there might be some kind of drama potential in these songs. Mm -hmm. So I was sent these extraordinary unreleased recordings by, you know, one of our greatest singer-songwriters. And it was a bit like being given the soundtrack to a movie and being asked to find the plot. Um, and I, the, what, the, all I knew in advance was that this was the five by 15 minute slot, which they have on Radio 4. So they, they commission a lot of different dramas, but this particular one is um, five episodes of 15 minutes each, which go out Monday to Friday across uh -huh. a week. Um, so the story had to play out over that. Um, and so I just began obsessively listening to these songs um, and crafted what became on Kosovo Field, a story about uh, two Pristina born uh, but Manchester raised uh, young people who were evacuated as very small children in the, in the 90s as unaccompanied child refugees um, and brought to the UK and grew up in the care system. Um, and they returned to Kosovo for the first time as young adults to try and find out what happened to their parents. Um, so it was sort of a metaphor for Kosovo itself, which is, yeah. a, is Europe's newest country. It was only uh, uh, founded in 2008 um, and uh, has still, you know, there's all kinds of issues surrounding that. The other thing that was in the mix, though, I mean, well, the first thing I did was I brought these two Kosovo links together. So naturally, Kushtrim and Intent became our cultural consultants on that BBC project. Um, and I absolutely couldn't have done it without them. They also hosted us when uh, Nadia and I went out to Kosovo to research it and were just gave us this brilliant kind of induction to, to Kosovo's um, contemporary life and its, and its recent history. But I became increasingly uncomfortable about essentially kind of mining another country's trauma with which I've got no connection for personal gain. You know, yeah. this was a project I would have been paid for by the BBC. Um, and it was very different to the Mulberry School experience where I was obviously still being paid to, to, to write with for and about mostly Bangladeshi girls. But it was over a much longer period and a much more embedded and collaborative process. Whereas I had like one week in Kosovo and the, you know, the rest of it was kind of reading. Um, and uh, so the solution I came up with, because I was also on a uh, full time at Tamasha at the time, and so and this was a freelance offer that through Radio Four, so I was a bit strapped for time. So the solution I came up with was to accept the commission, but to give Tamasha the fee from the BBC um, on the proviso that it be ring fenced for an on ongoing international collaboration with Kosovo and its writers. Mm -hmm. um, who, having been out there, I was just, I, I, I ran some workshops, Intent has a writer's group, um, and as a kind of thank you to them, I ran a few workshops on radio drama writing and was just so impressed 
with the talent out there um, and the stories. Again, un these untapped stories, you know, investigative playwriting, looking for where where haven't we heard from yet. Um, and uh, so, and one, so one thing led to another. The, the fee that I kind of I gave to Tamasha became a little budget for that ongoing international collaboration. It funded a couple of return trips, um, including one by Miran Hajic and um, Tamasha's lead producer, Debo Adebayo who went out to kind of scope out the infrastructure for recording audio drama in Kosovo, you know, what kind of music studios and radio stations are there and that kind of thing. Um, and the, the, in, I, was, I was supporting the writers from the, the Intent Writers Group as well with developing their own short audio dramas, um, two of which, along with Miran's, uh, make up the first series of uh, uh, the Out of the Woods podcast. Um, and there's more to come as well. I mean, we, we, we've, Miriam, was, Miriam was brilliant in raising the funds to make these three from, from Arts Council England. We supported him as a writer producer. Um, he's another graduate of our Tamasha Playwrights Group. So this was, you know, this sort of pieces of a jigsaw on the table in front of me. I was kind of arranging to, to create projects. Um, as has been such a big part of my job over the years. Um, and here we are with a kind of first series. And so rather than just kind of present these to the world as like, here's some random plays from the Balkans, <laughs> I, we actually thought, no, actually, let's let's present this as a, and let's found a new podcast brand. Um, because I know that there's enough talent out there. And I hope now that we've raised the money for this, enough kind of funding opportunities to, to make more, to really sustain that. Um, and also I've become very excited pre-pandemic actually but more you know obviously it's taken off since the pandemic with all the digital opportunities for stories and storytelling and, and breaking down international boundaries and experiencing one another's worlds particularly through podcasts which and, and fictional drama podcasts I, I mean when I say that um because they're kind of like a periscope you can yeah. sort of like you, you can focus on a particular part of the world and the audience sort of pops up there and when you're listening on headphones which most people do these days it's so immersive and it's so affecting um, and I've always felt like audio drama it, it is much or in some cases more than theatre actually is a kind of hotline to the heart it's yeah. a very one-to-one -one intense experience for the audience and this is a region with you know that's been through some pretty intense experiences yeah. that said one of the total joys and delights of this project has been to discover that the Kosovan writers don't want to look backwards to the war at all. Mm. You know, that was 20 years ago. There's a whole generation who's grown up since then. My drama focused on it because I was kind of taking my cue from PJ Harvey's songs. Yeah. But the new plays, they're brilliantly hilarious kind of political satires. And, <laughs> um, they don't mention the war at all. They're just about, you know, ordinary life in, in, in Kosovo. Um, and, the, and, and they're so refreshing for it and genuinely feel like the voice of a new generation coming through. So I'm really delighted that, that the, the tragedy essentially that I wrote led <laughs> to these wonderful non-tragedies and, and in most cases, brilliant comedies. Um, because that's all that these writers want. They, they don't yeah. want to the baggage of that past they don't want to be representatives for for all of that they just want to be artists like any other writers yeah. across Europe and, and tell whatever stories they want right exactly so how, how many episodes are there and how many uh writers are you working with so there's three uh there's miran's piece uh which is about 40 minutes long uh, which is the first one called fifth dimension um his is really interesting because uh, miran's from um uh, bosnian heritage he was born in sarajevo but was evacuated like the characters in my play as a very small child and grew up in london Mm. Um, and so for him to return to the Balkans for this project, uh, we teamed him up with uh, a, comp a local Kosovan composer, Trim Odomi, who's um, quite well known out there, um, because we wanted to sort of mirror the process that I went through with PJ Harvey. Um, so essentially starting with music as a stimulus. Um, and he came up with Fifth Dimension, which is a, a, a also inspired by Trimor's story, who a lot of Kosovans have visa problems. They, they find it very difficult to travel around Europe because not, they're not part of the EU and, all of, and not all European countries acknowledge Kosovo as a country. Yeah. So like Spain, for example, has its own breakaway region in Catalonia and doesn't want to encourage other breakaway regions like, you know, mm. Kosovo from um, Serbia, Albania. Um, so visas are a real issue. So they often can't travel. So even when they have, you know, world premieres on internationally, Trimor couldn't go to his own opening. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah. Um, and so Miran was really struck by this. And, and that inspired his, the idea for his play, which is um, inspired because it's all set in Britain. It's sort of through, it's got sort of through kind of the Balkans and back again. We sort of see ourselves reflected. And it's in a kind of near future dystopia where... Um, the government, a kind of a, a, a sort of quite rapidly nationalist government, commissions a new national anthem. 
Um, and uh, the composer who gets caught up in that finds himself kind of increasingly conflicted. Um, uh, so it's a brilliantly sort of sideways look at, at, at our own situation. And um, because whilst he was writing it, Miriam was writing it, the whole Brexit vote was going on and the country here felt more divided than ever. And, and it felt like actually setting something over here could have sort of echoes of what happens when, when you know, sort of geopolitical blocks break up which mm. you know might still happen over here with you know Ireland and, and Wales and Scotland kind of tugging at the seams um so he's written that and it's brilliantly I mean it is quite sad and, and tragic but it's also hilariously funny as well um and then the other two are by two um brand new writers who we discovered in Pristina through the intent writers group Agnesa Mehanoli and Upiana Manloku um so Agnesa's piece um is called where is Mr President uh, and is uh, about the cost of the president not showing up at an independence day rally and the kind of panic around where he is because it lasts for days and um the i'm not going to give any spoilers because there's a there's a, <laughs> there's a there's a brilliant twist in it which could only happen on on in audio um <laughs> they come up with a, a, a hilarious idea for his replacement um so that's about 25 minutes long um and it's just a great political satire about any dysfunctional country and government really but <laughs> it's you know obviously inspired by theirs um and then all piano's piece nude um isn't really political at all it's about a young painter guri who um has an exhibition um just before he gets a um a bursary to, to travel to london and study at central saint martins um which you know is a big deal for for people from eastern europe um and he has an exhibition before he goes where he exhibits some new paintings all of which are nude and his mum and her best friend go along to the opening um and again, no spoilers, but they're kind of shocked by what they find. Um, and it's it's just a, a, a lovely sort of um, intergenerational story about kind of misunderstandings around art and beauty and, and um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and, a mom, and my mother and her son. Um, so those are our three. I mean, we've done this all on, on a budget and, and big thanks to Arts Council England for um, providing us with that. Um, it's uh, we're hoping that this will be, it, now that these sort of exist in the world, they're available on all podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else for free, permanently, you know, worldwide, anyone can listen. Um, as I found in the past, once creative projects are kind of born and exist in the world in some way, it becomes easier to fundraise to do more. Um, mm. So, we, you know, plans are afoot for a second series. We've certainly got the talent and plays in the pipeline. Um, I'm hoping there might be another Arts Council application or, or possibly even some international funds that that, that could get involved because um, we've got something to show for for all of this now. It's not, it's not pie in the sky, it's a real thing. Yeah. Um, and I really hope that it will stay and grow and become kind of locally owned and led as well. Mm -hmm. um, in much the same way as my ambitions at Mulberry School were for the, the 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 work there to have a life beyond my involvement, which it certainly did, because Mulberry Theatre Company led to um, Rightful Place Theatre Company, which is a sort of alumni group that's still active around there. Um, so yeah, the podcast is sort of a gift to the region in a way. I sort of want to elevate them and their voices in a, in a in a, a sustainable and, and ongoing way, and I, I really hope it does do that. That sounds absolutely amazing. I, I can't wait to tune in uh, when Out of the Woods is uh, released on podcast. So thank you so much. They're for out now. They're out now. They're out so, now. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, can, as of, I think yesterday. Um, so yeah, just uh, putting Out of the Woods, new place from the Balkans, Apple, Spotify, any podcast platforms, you'll find it. Oh, fantastic. Brilliant. Well, um, we're coming to the end of our, our time together now, really sadly, actually, because I'm enjoying so much listening to you talk about your work and your projects. Um, but I really wanted to ask you just uh, two, two final questions, really. Um, one is really, what do you think needs to be done in the in the theatre drama industry to create more opportunities for marginalised voices to be heard? And are there any inspiring examples you can share with us of where this has been done uh, successfully? Oh wow! You say we're coming to the end. That's a whole other. Whole other. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there are, there has been a, there, in the time that I've been working in theatre, which is you know I'm getting on now, so twenty years or something. Um, it, it, there has been a lot of improvements, you know. Um, there's been you know various um, uh, initiatives at, 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 at sort of um, freelance artist level from writers, actors directors, producers, quite a lot of which have come through our company, Tomasha, actually, for a small company, we've, we've led on a lot of these and, and kind of come up with these models. Um, but perhaps um, most inspiringly, there's been, a, there's been over the past five or six years, there's been a, a 
big change of artistic director leadership across the sector um, with, um, and it's not been the usual kind of artistic directors, musical chairs kind of swapping jobs. Mm. There's been it, it, a whole new generation coming in. So, um, and most, and a lot of them are, you know, black Asian or, or mixed heritage in different ways. Um, so the early wave was kind of Indu Rubassingham at, at, at the Tricycle Now Kiln Theatre, uh, Kwame Kwayama at the Young Vic. Um, but then since then, you know, we've had, um, uh, uh, Nadia Fall at Stratford East um, and uh, Roy Weiss at uh, Manchester Royal Exchange and um, there's like lots of different examples um, all of which I think is fantastic because it will embed a much greater commitment to diverse practice and, and voices and, and nurturing new talent at the sort of head of those companies which so I think that's a real positive that said uh, those poor uh, new artistic directors have had their kind of legs cut off by the pandemic shortly after yeah. starting their jobs and of course some theatres have become, I mean, they, they, you know, a lot of them have been closed and, and going bust and, and making redundancies. So it's been a really, really difficult time for venues. Um, but then again, every cloud, and uh, as awful as that is, and, and, you know, I sincerely hope everyone recovers from it, what it has done is it's the, it, the, the bricks and mortar infrastructure of theatre has sort of got frozen up in, in, in all of that because there's so many costs associated with running buildings. And it did clear the field for a while last year for the non-building based companies like ours, like Tamasha and other touring companies, many of whom are at the really at the cutting edge of supporting diverse new talent to kind of we sort of temporarily inherited the theater industry like we were mm. still we had we were never busier last year <laughs> uh, with all kinds of different digital projects and schools sort of support for drama teachers and podcast audio we've recorded stuff under lockdown conditions you know you don't even i mean it's, it's if you can get into a studio it's, it's it's good but it's not essential you can post actors microphones you can do it on zoom as long as the audio tracks are good a good editor can mix them together so i think there's been a, a kind of an explosion of, of of new independent work by um either either independent artists uh, or smaller companies many of whom support those diverse voices so and i do see a lot of those coming through and and kind of taking up their rightful place in you know in the mainstream a little bit more as it starts to recover i think the biggest hurdle will be there's a huge backlog of work yeah. from pre-pandemic which got cancelled which i think venues feel kind of you know like they ought to honor which i can understand um but the other that it doesn't does mean that new work's not going to get commissioned for a while Mm. Um, and it does also create or rather add to the, what were the already kind of risk averse culture around new work and especially uh, new work by, you know, writers from diverse backgrounds, culturally diverse backgrounds, which has always been seen as the most risky. Mm. Um, I think for a while we're going to see well-known revivals of well-known titles with stars in the cast. Um, yeah. You know, there's a time and a place and an audience for that, for sure. But I think we need to make sure that, that, that those main stage opportunities aren't closed down to the new talent that we've been nurturing for the, the past few years. Um, I mean, I'm kind of cautiously optimistic, but I think, as always, we need to kind of keep plugging in, plugging away. I think it's, e it's easy for venues who are under a lot of pressure to sort of take the easy route um and yeah. you know god knows they've worked hard and and could do with a break but mm -hmm. the easy route is often the the known route where you know it's the same old um so i think we kind of need to guard against that but with these new leaderships in place i do think that, that the future's the future's bright around that um as is the opportunities across other media you know yeah. theater's always been a, a, a sort of a, a strange little place to try and build a career <laughs> um and actually if you can train people in just how to tell their stories then that opens up a lot more opportunities um, of the kind that we're doing. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm stepping down from Tamasha, as I said, so I hope that, 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 you know, and that's also, again, kind of deliberate in that I don't believe in sitting on these jobs for years. Uh, yeah. I think it blocks the flow. Mm. When you and we are a company that gives people their first breaks, you know, including my role. It was my first artistic director job. And I hope and, you know, and expect it may well go to someone else who, who is their first artistic director job. So um, it's also about the kind of the, the big players in the industry sticking by the smaller players like us yeah. um, and partnering up and making sure that, that all the groundwork we've been doing for, frankly, decades in some, in some cases. <laughs> Um, isn't sort of lost and, and is sort of, you know, brought and welcomed into the mainstream as, as, as a channel for, for that new talent. Amazing. Thank you. And um, you, you've touched on this a little bit already, but I did want to ask a bit about COVID-19, of course. I mean, we can't really ignore it. Um, but what do you think maybe the, the government could or should have done to support theatres, actors, playwrights more effectively during those um, difficult times and, you know, and are still difficult times now? Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, it's hard. So it's, again, yeah. that's a whole other episode. Um, <laughs> so, you know, they did come good in the end. There was a cultural rescue fund, uh, which was a, a, a bailout um, by the Arts Council to kind of stop uh, companies going bust. Um, the first round of it mostly was aimed at um, theatre buildings. Like, we weren't eligible, for example, because uh, although we've not got <laughs> much resources, we weren't about to go bust, mm-hmm. um, whereas a lot of venues were. So it kind of went to just preserving the bricks and mortar infrastructure. And very little of it went to freelance artists, m- many of whom live a kind of hand-to-mouth existence. Yeah. So the tragedy has been a lot of those uh, artists like having to, to look outside the theatre industry or indeed the creative you know, industries at all just to make a living. And I do worry that we'll have lost a generation there um, because it's, it's, hard, it's hard to break back in again once you've kind of had to do that. Um, that I mean... Th- there's been a lot more joined. I mean, the government stuff aside, I mean, people who run buildings or commercial venues would tell you more about things like the need for a government-backed insurance scheme because it's so expensive to rehearse plays and pay your actors and team and build the set, only for then there to be a third, fourth wave of lockdowns or whatever. You lose all that money. And if you are not insured, that is that is you will go bust you know yeah, yeah. Um, so there's all that side of things um but one again silver linings and trying to kind of look for the positives we're more connected than we ever were, were as a theatre industry now um and everyone's talking to each other uh, and all the touring companies for example have these regular zoom meetings and we kind of share intel and intelligence. You mentioned my um, 2013 in Battalions campaign, um, which was sort of focused around a report that I co-wrote, a piece of research. Um, at the start of the pandemic, when it looked like it wasn't clear whether or not the government were going to bail out the cultural sector, um, I kind of resurrected that brand. And, and there's a WhatsApp group now of like over 150, uh, you know, senior theatre managers in, in a group where we can all kind of talk to one another, um, compare notes and also strategies around uh, communication communications and how we talk to government about these issues um so yeah i mean it's the it, we, we, it, it's uncharted territory it's really hard to say what the future will hold but um i think there's enough committed people in our sector to to to, to ensure that it survives um I mean, governments could always be doing more, but, you know, they've also got a lot of competing demands on their time and resources. So it's it's hard to stand out. But, um, you know, I think we are where we are. And um, I think there's enough uh, good, new, interesting work coming through um, to to, to sort of give us a bit of hope. Uh, Not least, if you will forgive the plug, uh, Tomasha's latest national tour, which is called Under the Mask, which is a new play written by a junior doctor who happened to be in our writers group as the pandemic um, kicked off this time last year and who's written uh, an extraordinary it's an audio installation which you experience live oh, wow. in the theater. so you get a set of headphones when you go in there's only 20 audience per show for social distancing reasons mm-hmm. you sit in your own chair sat under your own spotlight there's a lighting design but you've all put on headphones and you listen to the play at the same time um oh wow awesome tour going to um theatre Cluid in wales and liverpool everyman uh, and uh the rose theater in kingston um uh, among other places um under the mask by sean sahota um do check it out because that's it's, it's an interesting sort of hybrid type show um it's not live actors it is pre-recorded but you, it, you experience it live with the audience and mm-hmm. something quite powerful about that especially because it focuses on covid and, and it, we recorded real sound from covid intensive care units which forms the kind of the background uh, sounds and we commissioned the writer okay. Chan Sohoka to write a, a, a text for actors over the top mm-hmm. um, so there's interesting hybrids coming out like that so that's a, a, a show for example that we could very easily remount and tour again because mm-hmm. you don't have to re-rehearse it you don't have all those costs of three four weeks rehearsals with all the actors you, it's literally yeah. just a stage manager and, and goes out and a, a kind of lighting design um, so I think that things like that are examples of, of how we can kind of tell stories more efficiently yeah. and m- more effectively in some cases and um, uh, perhaps in a way that empowers the smaller companies to bring some of these diverse voices to, to, to greater audiences than they might otherwise have had if it was just sort of purely live stage shows. Yeah absolutely well thank you so much Finn for um, your time with us today and for being so inspirational and for Thank explaining it's just yeah and just explaining so well and so clearly about you know bringing diverse voices to to theatre and audio drama and and how effective that is and and how exciting it is as well um, to be able to know that we're going to have all of these incredible stories being told so thank, thank you, you again so much for your time and can um, I, thank you can I plug our website tomorrow? of course 
Okay, so um, Tamasha, T-A-M-A-S-H-A, uh, it's a word in uh, Hindi and Urdu, which means causing a commotion. Um, and we've certainly <laughs> done that for the last 30 years. Um, so tamasha.org.uk, all of these projects, uh, including Out of the Woods and Under the Mask, um, you'll find on there. Thank you very much. Pleasure, thank you. Out of the Woods, a new podcast series of compelling audio dramas from the Balkans. Series 1, Kosovo. Excuse me, sir. Is it Tom Farrell? Yes. My name is Robert. I'm from the Department of Culture. Can I speak with you for a minute? Fifth Dimension by Miran Hajic. <gasps> Look at these people, Tom. Celebrating their nation. Taking pride. Look at what it means to them. Look at what the flag means to them. With original music by Trimor Domi. Doesn't it make you angry? After what they've done to your family? It does. But I feel powerless. You're not. Nude by Ulfian Maloko. Samia, how do I look? You look fine. You remind me of myself before kids. Cool, cool, Samia! Oh my god! Oh my god. Gure, what did you do? It's not the time, Mum. Nazmia, are you okay? And where is Mr. President? By Agnesa Mehanovi. Excuse me, sir! Sir, excuse me! Where is Mr. President? Hey, hey, sir. Can you please get out of the way? You were guarding him just Sorry, now. Sorry, no did questions. You Move aside. We'll step up your security. I have a young family. So do I. Yes, but it's not my job to risk my life. Out of the Woods. New place from the Balkans. Brought to you by Miran Hajic Productions. Supported by Tamasha Intent New Theatre and Arts Council England. All episodes will be available from June 21st. Subscribe now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, Finn, for being with us today to discuss diverse voices in theatre and audio drama. Do tune in to listen to Finn's podcast, Out of the Woods, which is available on all podcast listening sites now. Thank you also to Merlin Thomas, our editor, and Robert Cochran, composer of our theme music. We hope you enjoyed this podcast, and if you haven't done so already, be sure to check out our other After Hours episodes from The Culture Bar, looking at women in publishing, the future of museums, and arts and politics. And to get all of that and more, please subscribe or leave us a review. Music